Welcome to Oslo, the best girl from Canada. We city. <laughs> Vancouver. Vancouver, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that is architecture. Architecture. Comedy channel. <laughs> Check this out. You can sit in the Viking chair yeah. and then go jump in this pile of water. Sana. Now, having been up way above the Arctic Circle, where there's permafrost all year, seeing so many of these tall buildings is crazy. Right, we're standing by this beautiful, beautiful bay with all of these floating lighthouses and tiny little islands. Now, what I want to show you sits directly like right across the street. So I'm standing in front of a decision point. It's this massive castle. So this castle is what King Hakon Magnuson built whenever he moved the capital down into... Oh, he brought some Scotland with him. How nice. I wore my Scotland shirt as a relic to our last day of Viking lore and King Hakon. Medieval age lore. <laughs> So basically, you could just roll in on your ship, come here, do some church stuff, and then this is all what Oslo was, like main town center with a lot of little settlements around it and near the ship. In around 1300, King Hakon Magnuson, who was the Viking King Hakon Magnuson, grandson, came here and died here in 1319. From 1319 to the mid 1600s, Norway was in conflict with Denmark. And so Norway was trying to keep its lands. Well, whenever they started fighting Denmark, Denmark kind of took over Oslo for a while. And from the 1600s, 1620s, Oslo was called Christiania. Not to be confused with Freetown. So in the 1920s, to reconnect more with their old Viking medieval lore, Christiania renamed the city to Oslo. So we're now walking into a city that's just gonna start celebrating their 100 year anniversary of being called Oslo again next year. So let's go explore and see more of what the city was. Now while Viking King God, Magnuson built this thing. It was continued to be built around and reinforced whenever Oslo was under control from Denmark. And you can see some of the Danish architecture here merged with more of that Viking architecture. Check that out. Look at that. Oh. Okay, check out this little plaque up here. It's from 1633. It's not old at all, is it? I don't know if I feel like paying the money to enter that. So we will continue to walk and decide later because it's really pretty on the outside. I'm on the outside. I'm looking in. I'm on the outside. I'm looking in. Oh, what's this? Oh, we have a cool torch. So back in the medieval times, there would have been a massive torch up here, lighting the way to the main castle. And there probably would have been a torch or two in here to just like give some light as you're walking through. Tiny little tunnel. A memorial to the deported Jews that were deported during World War II. And what I find interesting is that, you know, we see stones on top of some of the chairs and this represents remembering someone from the Jewish religion that was died. So instead of laying flowers, you put a stone on top of the grave. But I like that we have this very simple, very peaceful memorial. I wish more people would come over here and remember what happened because Who's to say it's not happening now with what other countries are doing? I say that plural. Let's go into 
Norway's Resistance Museum. So on April 9th, 1940, Norway was invaded and attacked by Nazi forces. This is how they traveled up here. We're in Oslo. The current Norway king at the time was overthrown by the Nazi ruler. And the Norway king fled to London for safety because he was no longer wanted anymore. So this comes from King Hakon, not the fifth, or Hanssonsen, or Magnuson, but the one that fled to London. So just a couple of months after he fled to London for exile, he started to send secret messages back to Norway to let the people here know that he was still around and that he was gonna help with the allied forces to free Norway. This is super cool. Check this out. So because there was so much censorship and stuff and like roadblocks and everything but around Norway, they had to send secret messages. And this was written in invisible ink. Look at that. Isn't that cool that we can still see it? Now, for some reason, Hitler thought that Norway would play a crucial role into winning the war. So he put 400,000 men here to guard Norway. I didn't know that. The height of the Nazi occupation, this is what it looked like. Effectively, in the matter of a couple of years, the Nazi party had become the biggest empire that Europe had seen since the Roman Empire. So on this map, all of these red dots are radio stations and the white dots are dropping zone. Now the dropping zone is where allied forces would drop supplies and weapons and all sorts of stuff to help the resistance. Okay, I've been to an extensive amount of World War II and resistant museums in Europe because I find them fascinating, especially with the global policy and today's current economics. This one was surprisingly one of the best I've been to. Okay, now we're gonna go explore something else that Oslo is very, very well known for. Right now, we're walking in front, behind, we're walking backwards in front of the Oslo City Hall. Once a year, the most influential, the most famous people gathered here for a meeting to receive a Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts. And we are going to go try to see where all of these super awesome people stand. If I stand in the feet of greatness and smartness, will I become great? Or am I already great? Guys, check this out. This is where the Nobel Peace Prize is given out. We're standing where some of the greatest people of our centuries have stood. It's so cool. <laughs> it's so pretty. Wow. The ceiling is super pretty. There's all sorts of murals and walls. The light is also really good inside here too. So in the early 1900s, whenever all of Europe was kind of preparing for war. You had the war in the south with the Balkans. You had the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You had the Ottoman Empire. You had all this stuff. In Norway, they were promoting peace and peace through negotiations and peace without war. Well, there was this dude named Alfred Nobel. He had over 355 patents and he was one of the biggest promoters of peace around there. In 1919, Woodrow Wilson got the Nobel Peace Prize for the work that he did with the League of Nations in helping to end World War I. So every year an award is given to people. So this is the Nobel Peace Prize and it's made with 18 karat gold. And on the front it has a photo of Alfred Nobel. On the back there's a photo of three men hugging each other. Three men hugging. Okay, now we're gonna go check out all of the Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Let's go look. Okay, so we've continued just exploring down the water. This is like the hottest day of summer I've had all summer. I'm 
Check out this face paint. Random awesome sculpture. Okay, so this art museum has two buildings in it. Unicorn. Why am I beeping? It's all coming from here. We see all these horses behind a fast moving windows background. And we can repeat it right here. And we continue. So far, this is a very cool art museum. Let's see what's behind this curtain. Hello. We're day two, as you can probably tell with my very nice change of outfit here. I ran out of steps yesterday in my feet and I got tired and my feet hurt. We're gonna start our day off today going to the Monk Museum. This guy was pretty famous and we'll learn more about him in a bit with some museum ASMR. So let's continue our art tour of Oslo. I don't know how to get in the building. Maybe here. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's get a ticket. Selfies. Title this one, Solo Travel. So Nietzsche inspired a lot of Monk's art, and it took him a while to figure out how to paint him, and this is how he did it. Now with Monk's whole exploration of psychology and the human experience, I think it's cool that he let Nietzsche inspire him so much. And now we have one of the most recently stole artworks. So don't steal it, because someone will find you and put it back where it was. So throughout Edward Monk's life, he dealt with a lot of tragedy, like his family, his mother died, his sister died from tuberculosis before like the age of 10, I think, super young. And then throughout his life, he dealt with a lot of mental health issues. He spent a bunch of time in mental hospitals to help recover. And when he wasn't in there, and when he was, he expressed what he was feeling and he explored concepts of a bunch of stuff. So I like how raw and how real his artwork is because of that. So yeah, guy's yeah, pretty cool. Okay, this one's huge. How would you get that much canvas? And just look at like how long it would have taken him to paint all of it. So all of the pieces in this room were made for the University of Oslo, Christiania at the time, in 1917. Some of them were too raunchy, but then eventually they were allowed into the university. So a lot of Mr. Monk's um, personal artifacts have been kept, like his diaries and his home stuff. So we're gonna go explore and see where this really cool dude lived. I can go in. Look, it's like oxen free. Maybe now we can see in here. Okay, we have we have our next destination. It says Asshole goes there. Okay. Look, there's a dude painting. Hey, 
able to paint hats, but boy, I showed them. Nobody's complaining about the hats I paint now. What is treated like a dog? These would have been the paintbrushes that he would have painted stuff like the scream and the other amazing artworks that he used. Just look at all of these different tinctures and stuff that he would have, you know, used to make the lithographs and some lithograph. So in 1940, whenever the Nazis raided Oslo, uh, Edward Munch got really scared about his artwork. And so what he did was he changed his entire will and he commissioned all to the city of Oslo, who by then had changed their name from Christiania to Oslo. And like in 1944, he ended up uh, dying just from natural causes and from sickness and stuff. But that's why the city of Oslo has so much of his artwork because he gave it to them. Okay, so apparently a bunch of people don't like how this building looks. I think it's quite fantastic. It's 12 stories inside. And when you're in there, you don't feel like you're in a 12 story building and they're art stories, which is like, I don't know, an art story feels like five or six levels higher than a normal story because you have to display these huge works of art. So that was the first time I've actually seen people get kicked out of an art museum and then re-enter and try not to get kicked out again. <laughs> uh, okay, Art Museum 101, don't touch the photos. And then when you're told to not touch the photos, don't touch the photos. Anyway, we are gonna go now walk up to more art because I've decided we're just gonna do Art Tour Explore here. I think it's gonna rain though because it smells like rain and the clouds look like rain. So, let's go. What? They do guided tours here of how they make the costumes. That would be so cool. I need this costume. Wow. If anyone makes vampire capes and feathers or whatever that was, chiffon. Okay, now here's what I don't understand. Yesterday I was out all day, and it was nice, and it reminded me of Gothenburg. Size of about half a million people. Now Oslo is like 700,000 people, 1.7 million if you include like all of the surrounding areas. Today, I cannot go anywhere without crowds and noise and entirely different than yesterday. And yeah, so that's that. So here's why AI is never gonna take over the world. I asked ChatGPT what to do in a city because I find that there's not very many activities. It told me to walk down this street. How is this enjoyable, Chad? I mean, come on. This is not. <laughs> This is not an activity, this is just people. <laughs> Send me to an abandoned building or something like that. Okay, I think I'm in the area of like fancy shops. I've walked by Louis Vuitton and other names I can't pronounce. But look at this building. There's all of these cool little buildings here that are not like the modern buildings by the port. And it's kind of nice to see something a little bit I don't know, Art Nouveau or something. I don't know what that is. I'm an architecture connoisseur, not proper labeler. So right now we're right in front of the National Theater as you can read up here. And I hope to find a little bit of dry refuge under this building. And if not, we're just gonna admire Mr. Bjornsson. Bjornster and Bjornsson? I mean, that's cool and everything but what i'm confused about is how the first and last name are always the same name for like really famous norwegian people like viking king hakon hakonson bjorn bjornson bjornstern bjornson anyway i got i'm glad i don't name things let's go walk in front of all of these pretty little flowers what is that? 
Look at this thing, you guys. Well, you're pretty. Okay, this is pretty far away. I've been walking for quite a while. But we're getting closer to Green Man on a horse. Maybe it's Hack on Magnuson. I don't know. Did they build green metal statues in the 1300s? We're going to go walk up and see. Okay. I'm not used to this heat. So this is a statue of Mr. Carl Johan, and we just walked up his avenue. Now, Mr. Carl Johan is a controversial person, apparently. Apparently he's a hero, but then he also raged a war against Norway. So that's something. And in front of us is the castle. It's closed, which probably means that the royal family is inside. So yeah. That's the statue. Now let's continue on our quest. Okay, we're on the other side of the castle right now. And around us are all of these beautiful embassies and like fancy, super fancy houses with blue plaques on them. So check this out. This building is very cool. Okay, I'm back to the part of Oslo that I love. Look at how many not people there are here. I don't know why they're all on that street. Like, you can buy things in any town, but what you can't see in any town is this beautiful architecture and these nice trees and the embassies. What is this? Is it like an old power box? See, when you just stay on the fancy shopping street, you don't get to see things like this. Well, that's really cool. Ah, the German embassy's down there. I passed the Thai embassy. So it has a very uh, Kensington, Chelsea, Knightsbridge vibe walking around here, except it's way more quiet. Just check that out. Like, if we would have stayed on Mr. Carl Johan's, Carl Johan? Yeah, Carl Johan Street, we wouldn't have seen all of this. Look at this, guys. We have a lot of random sculptures. And I think we have a picture of Michael Jordan. I mean, a sculpture of Michael Jordan up here. I will show you, one second. Jump cut, uh, whoa. Michael Jackson, I met Michael Jackson. Jump cut to Michael Jackson. Maybe that's where Michael Jackson got the idea. Throwing baby off the bridge or throwing baby off the ceiling. Okay, let's go appreciate more of these crazy art pieces. This is pretty epic. It's like the St. Charles Bridge, but I don't know. There's like random stories being told here. I believe there's some lore about rubbing these babies because throughout the bridge, there are some of the babies and they just have like, they're very shiny and still brass. Spreading COVID or some other skin transmitted disease maybe? I don't know. Go good baby. One thing I both appreciate and I'm not sure of why is that everyone is naked. Very thick, like a like a stress relief ball, like a Nickelodeon stress relief ball. It's like a Swiss Guard rose. Look at that pretty little flower. Let's see, it's quite an interesting experience. So some of these statues are quite grotesque and emotional and others are just beautiful and calm and peaceful. Okay, now we're in front, the humble Nordic Zodiac statue. Now we've seen the Zodiac statue in Bucharest. I gotta say, Norway, you are outdone. <laughs> 
Now, how is that for an art tour around Oslo? I hope you enjoyed it. You got some art, you got some history, you got some World War II lore, you got the end of the Viking lore. Like, I loved it. Like, subscribe or don't. See you in Austria. Ciao.